Acrylic paints were developed in the mid-20th century, and offering an unmatched level of versatility and ease of use quickly became a favorite among artists of all skill levels. Unlike oil paints, acrylics dry quickly, allowing artists to work at a faster pace or easily make changes. They adhere well to a variety of surfaces, are incredibly versatile in how they can be applied, and clean up with water, eliminating the need for solvents. Whether you're interested in fine detail work, layering, or even textured impasto techniques, acrylics provide the flexibility to bring your artistic vision to life. While acrylics are less expensive than oil paint, it's still great to get the most for your money. The truth is, you really don't need that many colors. What I recommend is simply to purchase a yellow, a red, and a blue, plus white, and black. With those few pigments, you can create almost any color that you want to. Now when you go to the store, you'll notice there's definitely more than one yellow and red and blue, so how do you choose which one to get? As you can see, each combination of different primary colors creates a very nuanced and interesting and beautiful mixture of colors. Is one better than the other? Of course not. It just depends on what you're trying to paint and what colors you like to use. One red makes it easier to mix a strong violet, while another red makes it easier to mix a strong orange. And it's the same for your mixes made with various yellows and various blues. If you don't know where to start, I'd recommend cadmium yellow light, cadmium red, ultramarine blue, titanium white, and Mars black. Now the use of black in art is a topic of some debate, as some artists point out that it can muddy your colors and misusing it may result in an unnatural look, as true black is quite rare in nature. However, I'll leave that up for you to decide whether you want to use it or not. If you want to mix your own deep dark black alternative, my favorite is Thalo Green plus Cadmium Red. It creates a beautiful and rich black, although Thalo Green is a strong color and you need to be careful when using it. You can also buy acrylics in heavy body, which is pretty thick, medium or soft body, which is, of course, right in the middle, or fluid acrylics, which are very thin. Heavy body is good for things like palette knife work or anywhere that you want to have good texture. While the thinner fluid acrylics are great for things like washes and glazes. You'll also notice that different brands of paint have student grade paint and artist grade paint. What's the difference? Really it comes down to the amount of binder in the paint versus the amount of pigment in the paint. Artist grade paint has a lot more pigment, therefore it covers better. So I always would recommend getting artist grade paint. However, if you can't afford artist grade paint across the board, the two colors that you really absolutely need artist grade paint are titanium white and any yellow that you use. Cadmium yellow does not cover at all in student grade paint, so you need it to be artist grade paint or you will end up frustrated. And what are you going to paint on? Acrylics can stick to just about anything, so you have a lot of options. The most popular, of course, is canvas. It usually comes mounted like this, and it's quite versatile. It also can come mounted on a panel, and it will almost always be pre gessoed. If you want to gesso it yourself, you have the flexibility to paint on something like MDF or other surfaces. What is gesso? Essentially, it is an acrylic primer that prepares your surface for painting. Like I said, most canvases that you buy in a store will already have gesso applied, so you really don't need to buy gesso yourself unless you're planning to paint on something like wood or MDF. Now when it comes to brushes, the main thing you want to make sure you do is get synthetic brushes. You do not want to use natural hair brushes with acrylic paints because when you are cleaning with water, natural hair brushes will soak up the water and it will get all weird and funky. The main types of brushes are flats, filberts, and rounds. And really, it comes down to your preference. So I just recommend buying a couple, seeing what you like, and then getting more when you need them. You probably don't need as many brushes as you might think either, because each brush can do a variety of brush strokes. So experiment with them and use them to their full ability. Some brushes that I love are from Princeton. The Catalyst and the Aspen series are both wonderful. You can't go wrong with them. And what about your palette? While you could paint on anything from a paper plate to glass, I recommend something called the Masterson Stay Wet Palette. 
Now the Masterson palette comes in different sizes. This is a 12 by 16. This is a smaller one called a handy palette. It has a lid so that it can be sealed and keep your paints wet on the inside. It also comes with a special type of paper that soaks water through and yet doesn't really deteriorate. It won't fall apart like a normal piece of paper would. Underneath there is a sponge which you can wet with water and when your paper is saturated it will soak up the water from the sponge and keep your paints wet for a much longer time than if it was just sitting out in the open air with no moisture underneath. The thing that is so great about the Stay Wet palette is that it allows you to mix colors and come back to them an hour, two hours, even days later and still use those colors. It also gives you time to mix more nuanced colors because you're able to mix back into colors that you created later, varying them slightly, making small changes little by little, and you'll have a very nuanced and harmonious painting in the end because of it. How should you organize your palette? Every artist has their own preference, and what really matters is that it makes sense to you and that you know it. But if you'd like my advice, this is what I would recommend. So when I'm organizing my palette with a primary palette, a limited palette, like I suggested in this video, I do it with color theory in mind. It's all about mixing colors. So I want to think about my yellow and my red and my blue and all the mixtures in between. And I want to be able to visualize them and see them. And when I create a palette and I lay out my paints in a palette, I would like to be able to know that if I mix my yellow with my blue, it's going to create this kind of green. If I add a little bit of black or a little bit of white to it, it will be somewhere in this range. So when I put my palette out, I want to think about it in that same way. I'm going to put my yellow in a corner, my red in a corner, my blue in a corner, and I'm going to mix my secondary colors in between. I put black right here and a double dose of white in the corner because I always seem to use about twice as much white because I'm mixing it in with all of the other colors. What's interesting is when you deal with a color wheel, if you start mixing to the complementary color on the other side, so if we mixed red with green, it would pull us more into the middle and in the middle of the color wheel, you often get more grayish colors, especially if you just add a little bit of white, you'll see those grayish colors coming through and they're very colorful and beautiful but again I like to organize my palette in that same manner so that I know if I'm mixing a yellow with a red it's gonna create something over here that I'll be able to go back to later and figure out how I made that color by the way one of the easiest ways to learn how to mix colors is by making these small little charts what you want to do is get something small this is a six by nine canvas and I write down which exact colors I'm using and then all I I do is make mixes. Just trying to make as many combinations and as many mixtures of colors as I possibly can and then trying a different set of colors. So these mixes look different than this and I can tell by looking at these which set of colors will work better for a scene. This is not complicated like some charts can be. It's one of the most straightforward ways to learn how to mix colors and then you have record of it. You could trade out all sorts of different colors and you'll come up with different mixes and each one will be unique, each one will be interesting and you will have learned a little bit more about how each of those colors works together. So what about the process of painting? The easiest way to get a successful painting in the end is to plan in the beginning. There are a thousand different ways you can get to the goal of having a beautiful painting. You can choose to paint on a white canvas, you can paint on a black canvas, you can paint on a colored canvas, you can paint with a palette knife, you can paint with small brushes, you can paint with big brushes. None of those things determine whether or not your painting is going to be beautiful or not. They're simply a matter of preference. So how do you get to your desired goal? I think the first thing you need to do is know what you are actually aiming for. They say if you aim for nothing, you'll hit it every time. So it's not enough to say, I want to paint a good painting. Think through what do you want your painting to look like? Do you want it to have thick brush strokes? Do you want it to be detailed and small and refined? Do you want it to be soft and nuanced? Do you want glowing light? Do you want it to be moody? What are the colors like? Are they vibrant and expressive or are they nuanced and subtle? 
All of these are choices that you have to make, but if you're going into your painting and you don't know what you want it to look like in the end, you'll never know when you get there. That's why I like to use a five-step framework that helps me know exactly where I'm going and it enables me to evaluate my painting and solve problems along the way. Step one is to design your painting. Step two is to draw your design onto your canvas or painting surface. Step three is to block in the main colors and values on your painting. Step four is to refine and adjust your values, shapes, and lighting. And step five is to finish your painting. Now, why is it helpful to break up your painting process in these steps? because you can evaluate each part of the painting along the way. If you don't have a good design, you need to work on that before you draw your design onto your canvas. If your drawing isn't accurate, you need to fix that before you start painting on it. Do you see how evaluating at each stage will help you make necessary corrections before you move on? Can I just add one little thing? Out of all the steps of the painting process, I believe that the very most important step is the first step, that is design. If you don't have a good design for your painting, it doesn't really matter how great your brush strokes are or how nice your colors are because the value contrast and the design of the painting and how it all works together is way more important than the individual parts. So taking five minutes at the beginning of your painting to do a thumbnail sketch and work on the design and figure out something that's going to work well is going to save you hours of headache at the end trying to fix something that has a major flaw because the overall design design is where the problem actually is. The thing about growing in skills is that you really need to start out with courage and enthusiasm because it's challenging. Keep moving forward. Here are a few things that will really help you on your creative journey. One, plan to paint. Make sure that you set up time in your schedule and don't be ashamed that you're blocking off that time to do this thing that you love. Two, Find friends. It's a lot more fun to take this creative journey with other people. So bring somebody along with you, find a group to belong to, and you're gonna enjoy this time so much more. Three, learn from others. Listen, art is not something that you arrive at and you know everything. You can always learn something. So be the student because it's gonna keep you young. Four, experiment a lot. Think outside the box, use different tools, incorporate things that you see other people doing into your work. Do those things things that will push you beyond your comfort zone and you're going to open up new pathways of learning and discover new things that you will love. Five, embrace mistakes. You will not be afraid of failure. Failure is not the opposite of success. It is part of success. You need to make mistakes. Put it as a goal that you're going to try things, you're going to experiment, and you're going to embrace mistakes. And lastly, have fun. This is going to be an incredible journey for you and I'm excited that you are on it. So just embrace it for all it is and have fun as you're growing and you're discovering who you are and what your creative expressive voice is. If you have any questions for me, type them in the comments below and I would love to come back and try to answer them for you. Hey, if you enjoyed this, it would mean the world to me if you would subscribe to the channel, like the video, share it with your friends, and then when you have a chance, come to acrylicuniversity.com where we would love to encourage you in your creative journey. Guys, remember this, you are loved and believed in and happy painting.